So hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome. Uh, I'm Susan Weinstein. I'm co-executive director at Families for Depression Awareness, and I am really glad that you could join us this evening or record it, whichever it happens to be, for part one of our series. Uh, this, is, this session is called Building a Treatment Team with Your Loved One. So um, appreciate you being here, taking the time to watch. You may be uh, new in this whole um, uh, mental health space. Uh, you may have been here for a while. You may be back again. Uh, no matter what it is, we hope we have something that will be of interest to you. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking with you. Uh, hopefully, you'll be joining us in our um, uh, Zoom room uh, after the presentation part. <clears throat> so this is part one of our two-part series on mobilizing the people that can help your loved one on the path to wellness. The second session which is focusing on the support team as opposed to the treatment team, will be on Thursday, February 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, we have a wealth of information to share with you, so keep an eye on the chat for helpful resources and links. And you know, if you're here, please feel free to share your resources in the comments uh, or in the chat, uh, depending whether you're on Facebook or here with us on Zoom. For those of you on Facebook, you know that we are streaming this live. Um, That'll be for about the first 40 minutes. We're going to have our panel discussion. Uh, it'll be recorded. It'll continue to be available on Facebook, and we will make it available on YouTube as well. Um, people who are registered will get um, the link uh, in their email in the next day or so. Um, when we end the live stream, uh, people who came on through Zoom uh, will be able to stay with us and engage in uh, you know, a smaller discussion and you know, more interactive uh, than you all listening to us. But if you are here on Facebook and you'd like to join that discussion, please go to um, familyaware.org slash trainings, and then just go ahead and register for this program. Nice. All right. Um, our agenda for this evening, uh, I'll speak briefly about FFDA. We'll meet the panel. The panel will discuss. We'll have the Zoom discussion. We'll wrap up. And um, I will just remind you uh, about taking the survey. <clears throat> so all in all, it'll be about an hour. Uh, Families for Depression Awareness, uh, presumably you've already, uh, well, either seen our social media or uh, been on our website. But since 2001, FFDA has been fighting stigma about mental health conditions and supporting caregivers of people living with mood disorders. Our mission, as you can see, is to, um, help families recognize and cope with depression and bipolar disorder to get people well and prevent suicides. We believe that mood disorders affect the whole family, not only the ones living with their own depression or bipolar disorder. It might be you know, that there's the genetic influence in depression or bipolar disorder or the ways that these disorders affect interpersonal relationships, or even that one person's depression can increase the household burden on the other person in the family or others in the family. So we believe that each family member should have their needs identified and addressed. We provide education, training, and support for family caregivers because to us, they hold a special place in suicide prevention. They're often among the first to notice that something's amiss with their loved one. They are motivated to do something about it. And they are also often positioned to tap into the resources that can support their loved one in getting care and getting well. We want caregivers to feel educated, equipped, and ready to provide the support that their loved ones need and deserve. Why do you keep doing this? Sorry, here we are. Our website is the hub of all of our resources. So please, familyaware.org, go visit. You'll find informational articles, um, lots of family stories and expert interviews. We have these online tests, uh, including the depression and bipolar screening test, uh, the caregiver stress test. Yes, we know you're a caregiver, you have stress. Uh, this helps you measure uh, what it is, but also points you to resources to help you manage your stress. Uh, we have our publications. Uh, the um, Most of them are very caregiver-centric, uh, and we like to examine things through the lens of the caregiver so that we're giving the kinds of advice and information that caregivers need to uh, feel confident and effective. Um, let's see, and now it is my great pleasure to um, 
introduce our three panelists. Uh, each of these women represents a role that may be included in your loved one's care, so let me introduce them. Uh, Dr. Letizia Baxter-Smith Baxter is a family psychiatric mental health, mental health nurse practitioner and a co-founder of Silver Lining Psychiatric Consultants in Middle Tennessee. Letizia received advanced nursing degrees from the Vanderbilt School of Nursing and Emory School of Nursing. She was chosen to be a SAMHSA Minority Fellow from 2018 to 2020. In addition to her practice, Letizia is a faculty member at Vanderbilt School of Nursing, where she previously served as chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Dr. Christina Clemens is a licensed mental health counselor in the Boston area. She holds a master's degree in mental health, addictions and school-based counseling, and a doctorate in education. She has a passion for working with adolescents and adults, particularly women, to effectively address and decrease symptoms of depression, anxiety, PTSD, and an array of other mental health challenges. Dr. Clemens works to bring awareness of mental health and decrease stigma around treatment in minority communities. Dr. Tia Tucker received her medical degree from the Latin American School of Medicine in Havana, Cuba, and her public health master's degree from Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. She is a family medicine doctor and the health equity director at Tufts Family Medicine Residency Program, where she enjoys working with community partners to advocate for health for all. Dr. Tucker practices at Cambridge Health Alliance in the Boston area. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so people can see us. There we are. All right, so doctor, doctor and doctor, I'm gonna have some questions for you and just to avoid, you know, like people talking at once, I'll just call on one of you to start. Um, so I think that for our audience, it would be really helpful for you to describe your professional role. So what's your role in the treatment team for someone diagnosed with depression and how do clients find you or patients or people with lived experience? Um, I'm gonna go by first names, uh, if that's okay with everybody. Um, Letizia, would you start us off? Yes, so um, as you mentioned, I'm a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And so I'll use a bunch of words and then I'll tell you guys what that really means. Um, my role in the treatment team is to assess and diagnose patients with any mental health needs that they may have. Um, and then I treat them and that can be through medication, through therapy or psychoeducation. Um, but what does that really look like? Well, typically when I meet a patient for the first time, um, I will go over what the presenting issue is, what brought them in, what made them want to come in and see me. And we explore that issue, what has worked for them, what hasn't worked for them. I'll ask a lot of questions about their medical history, about their psychiatric history, whether there's been hospitalizations or previous medications or therapy or other types of treatment. Um, and then I'll talk a lot about family history and finding out if there might be um, things that run in the family like anxiety or depression and what that looks like and how what has worked for other people in the family. And then I'd like to find out a little bit about my clients socially as well. What do they do for a living? What does their family look like? Who is their support systems? And then together we work to figure out what will be the best plan uh, moving forward to help treat whatever the presenting issue is that they came in with. Um, and I know you mentioned how do people usually find me? Believe it or not, most people are referred from primary care physicians. Um, I don't know, yes, Tia. I don't know if, um, well, I do know that um, as psych MPs and psychiatrists, uh, uh, there are a lot of places we just aren't, we just aren't there. And so people will reach out to their primary care provider first. Um, but then sometimes people may think that they really have a physical health issue and it may be manifesting as that, but as um, they work with their PCP and they realize everything's okay physically, then that's when we may determine that maybe there's something else that may be going on from a mental health perspective. So they're usually referred um, from someone like a PCP, sometimes therapist. Um, and then I will have people that will um, seek me maybe because they know from a family history um, that, that do seek me out um, first, but that is usually not how we get started. 
And do you also do therapy or are you sticking to the I can, assessment? I can, I can do therapy. I will tell you, I, I tend to not now, it depends on who your psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner is. We all have varying degrees of, of comfort in our treatment. Um, and so some of us have gone on and gotten um, certifications for a lot of different therapies. I tend to stick to like CBT and motivational interviewing, those types of things. Um, and if my clients need more in-depth therapy, then I will refer them to a therapist. Excellent. Thank you. Christina, how about you? I guess I'll jump in because I'm the therapist that gets the referrals from the <laughs> Um, I actually have two different roles. So I do work in a public school in the city of Boston, and my clients in that setting are younger. They're 14 to 16, which is a different developmental stage. And then I also work with adults. Um, let's see. In my role in working with children, it is a lot of working with parents. That's kind of what it boils down to. Um, you see it's a student that's struggling. It usually starts academically and then they get a referral to me. Um, and we dig a little bit deeper to see what types of outside influences are affecting the child inside of school. Um, I'm sure as you guys all know, as mental health professionals, we're seeing a lot of behaviors that we probably haven't seen before and they're coming in intense and in large numbers. Um, and so it's really important for us to work very closely with families, particularly to get outside help if we can, because working in a school, you can only do so much. Now, jumping over to working with adults, um, a lot of adults, I think, are a little bit more willing and they want to know what's going on with them and they're willing to be educated on it and they're willing to explore different treatment options. So it is my role um, in working with the adults. I do a lot of psychoeducation to, for them to understand what is happening in their bodies, what is happening in their brains, um, and really letting them lead whatever the treatment is going to be. You have some people that are totally against taking medication, and that's okay. We have to find a way to work around that. And it doesn't mean they're not ever going to get to that point, but they don't want to now. So really identifying where the person is in, in that moment and working from there. And a large part of my work on both ends is relationship building because you want your patients or your clients to trust that you have their best interests at heart. And that, that makes them, I think, a little bit more willing to, I, to actually take these issues on head on, which maybe they hadn't before. Um, and let's see, how do people find me? Um, Sometimes I don't even know. I get emails from people um, like so-and-so said you're taking clients. Um, internet, I'm in a lot of practitioners of color groups um, that people find me in. And sometimes like private referrals that I get from people I know or people they know. So you, you never know. They, they find you. <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. Yeah. Um, both of you have used the uh, expression psychoeducation. Can you just take a minute and clarify what that means? Um, it's just making sure that they understand the educational piece of what is going on. The the one hundred percent in black and white from the DSM. This is what that means. And then also for me, breaking it down into terms that they understand, um, because we clinically understand what that means, and then they're like, "What?" So you're like, "Okay, so person to person, here's what that means." And then you find a way to kind of break it down so that they understand it. So getting them to understand what is actually happening to them. That's great. Thank you so much. All right, Tia, what about you? Oh, I'm the one making the referrals. I'm the PCP. I'm the family medicine doctor. <laughs> I'm not a therapist, though my patients often think I am. They are asking me um, a lot of the times it's, it's very difficult these days to try to find um, people like Dr. Clemens and Dr. Smith. Um, because mental health care is just so needed now. And so a lot of the time, some of my patients, um, to kind of skip ahead and say how they find me, um, I've been in this location for five years. So a lot of the people that I have on my panel, I've known for five years and um, I take care of them. And sometimes I take care of them, their daughter, their stepmother, their mother-in-law. I, I 
it's my favorite thing about family medicine is taking care of the whole family. And so a lot of the times, um, by the time we're ready to make a referral about mental health, we've already kind of established a relationship and trust and kind of already know, you know, is this stemming from something like an adjustment reaction where you were fine and then something really bad happened to you. And now you're struggling trying to figure out how to make life work for you again. And um, sometimes it's like, well, we knew that something was going on. And, um, you know, now we're ready to, to talk about it and to deal with it. My job a lot of the time um, is reassuring people that what's happening to them is not, um, you know, we're not, we're not using words like crazy because sometimes the patients, the patients and I use very familiar words with each other. So sometimes they'll be like, I'm, I feel like I'm crazy. Like you're not crazy. This is something that happens to a lot of people. And um, we can, we can help you do with that. I love, um, I do a lot of behavioral education, asking people why they think things are happening to them. And so we can make shared decision-making together um, and a lot of motivational interviewing. I love CBT. I, since I'm not a therapist, I don't do CBT, but I've used it myself. So I'm a big fan. Um, and sometimes my role is helping people set goals for themselves. So if they do say, you know, Dr. Tucker I was listening to what you said and you said, you know, I, that therapy might work for me, but I don't, I don't want to sit, you know, on a couch with my feet up. Like that just doesn't sound right. And I say, well, that's not what therapy looks like all the time. There's different kinds of therapy. It's not just talk therapy. You could be doing DBT or CBT and let's talk about what you want. And then when we make the referral, we can look for somebody who is um, learned in these things and they can help you figure out what your goals are. Um, there was another question that I forgot. Before, how do they find you? What's your role? But you already did that. Yeah. <laughs> but I actually have a question for you, um, which is not one of the ones. Uh, <laughs> last I knew, um, about uh, two thirds of prescriptions for antidepressants were written by primary care providers. Is that something that you do? I do prescribe medications. Um, I make it very clear to my patients that um, evidence says, evidence-based medicine says that the best thing, especially for people who are suffering with severe mental illness, is to prescribe medication and do therapy. So I, again, always share decision-making with my patients because we wanna be trauma-informed and we wanna be um, respecting people's autonomy. Um, I never make anybody start anything, but I will suggest like, Sometimes they're like, I don't really want to do medication. It's like, that's fine. Um, let's talk about what you can do. And it might not always be like you're going to see the therapist. It might be, let's talk about some of the supports you can have and use some positive psychology to help you be strong and build that scaffolding up for you for support so you don't um, fall into a traumatic space for yourself. And how long are your appointments? <laughs> not very long. I am always late. <laughs> Especially some of my patients say, well, I just want to talk to you. And I said, well, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> I want you to come back and talk to me. That's fine. But you know, I'm not a therapist. So. Well, yeah. just not officially. <laughs> um, uh, and just you know, on the, on the topic of finding um, providers, uh, particularly therapists and uh, on the psychiatric and psych psychological side, um, we refer people to InnoPsych, which is uh, for providers of color and um, also to Psychology Today, which has support groups and, you know, a whole lot of things and, you know, you specify your insurance and things. So it makes it really easy. Um, uh, and then there's the whole thing about telehealth. So hopefully we're doing things to make uh, care more available. All right, Tia, how can caregivers help their loved ones create a treatment team to manage their depression? That's a great question. So um, I like starting with the PCP because usually this is somebody who you've already built a relationship with. Like in my case, I, I might already know you, I already know your family. And so nothing you're telling me is going to feel you know, like we're blowing something out of proportion or I'm going to feel like, well, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you know, and um, we already have a relationship and we can build um, from that. And your PCP is the person who, like I said, I'm the one who makes the referrals. So I'm the one who's sending you to Dr. Clemens and Dr. Smith. Um, also, we have regular follow-up. 
with so if you have a PCP and I'm seeing you in January for this, I'm going to say, do you want to follow up with me in two weeks or in a month and we can see how things are going? Make sure that your referral even went through. When are you going to have um, another appointment? And then to, you know, we're asking you the questions and helping you make a safety plan as well. Um, I think that being the family medicine doctor, you know, I'm always having other people in the room so we get to decide um, when I'm talking to your loved one, loved one about their mental health and they say, my husband, my son, my, my aunt is really big support with, can they come in the room with me? Of course. And also setting boundaries and saying like, I noticed that you came in with this person. Do you mind if we have some time to ourselves and then say, you sure, do you want this person in the room with you? Is it okay if they hear this? We're going to be talking about very personal things. I might ask you some questions that are uncomfortable that you might not be ready to share the depths of what you're going through with this person yet. And you deserve privacy and you deserve autonomy. Um, that might be very hard for some caregivers to hear, especially people who are um, parents. Um, sometimes they say, you know, well, it's my child. Whatever they're going through, you can tell me. And um, once you get to a certain age, the teenager age, they do have rights to privacy. And um, a lot of us have told our patients because it's true, you are protected. Um, our language, our meetings are protected. The subjects of what we're talking about are protected. And I cannot tell your parents unless you tell me that you're going to hurt yourself or hurt someone else. Um, and this is something that makes people very uncomfortable. Sometimes parents and they they want to know. I would counsel parents that if you are worried about your kid or just a caregiver, if you're worried about your loved one, sometimes it's a brother or a sister. And they say, I, I want to tell you what's going on with them. I don't know if they're being honest with you about what's going on, or I really want to help. And I know things. Um, it's never okay for me to share somebody's personal health information with someone else, but I can always listen. If you want to, if you want to talk to me and you want to say, you know, I, they told me that they were um, they told you that they were fine, but I heard them crying all last night and all this morning. And, you know, they recently broke up with someone. I think they need more support than they're letting on. And maybe if you ask to talk to them again in a week, maybe it'll be different. That's really helpful. And I would appreciate that. I'm just not going to share um, <laughs> their personal information with you. So starting with the PCP, I think is great. And then also you being part of the team means that um, caregiver fatigue is real. You have to take care of yourself. And a lot of the times the people that are caregivers, they feel very selfish. They're, they don't want, they're scared that if they don't do something, their loved one is going to hurt themselves or they're not going to get better and it's going to be their fault because they weren't there. But it's really important, you know, that saying, sometimes it sounds kind of corny, you can't pour from an empty cup, but it's absolutely true. If you have not taken care of yourself and recognized how much it takes to care for someone who has mental illness, how much it takes from you. You are probably a very strong person, a very wise person. You know, you, you might have everything together, but you still have to take care of yourself. Um, and I think that's probably the first thing that I would make sure um, caregivers knew. Um, I also think that it's really important for um, caregivers when you're developing this, this plan, you know, you have your PCP, you have the therapist. Um, if there is somebody who's following your loved one, as far as like ph psychopharm is, is concerned, I prescribe meds, but maybe you have somebody else who's doing it um, to keep the med list. Um, and if they're, if you're in a, allowed to do this part of their care to keep the med list and be aware of how much they're taking and when and part of a good safety plan you can help ensure with your with your your loved one if you're the caregiver is making sure that um, sometimes meds need to be away from a patient if they've had a history of um, of self-harm or thinking that they might have some self-harm you can make a safety plan and say like well these medications we're going to keep locked away and um, that's something that everybody can can agree on. You don't have to say, well, I'm making sure you can make a, a plan as, as much as you can involve yourself as somebody who's part of the plan and not an enforcer, the more respect and the more that person is going to want to let you be involved in their care. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other thing that I oh, the other thing I wanted to say as far as the safety plan is is concerned is um, having a number nearby that, you know, you can call when you're in over your head. Um, we have. Um, we have some mental health care partners that work with us within our clinic that um, they are available for people if we can't get um, psych in the room with us 
or if they want to message them. But we also have an emergency number that if they call them, they will come to the house. And they're not the police, because I think that's something that's really scary sometimes, especially for people of color um, in these this day and age. If um, their loved one is in trouble, they are scared to call the police because they're scared that things are going to be escalated or somebody will actually get hurt. Um, so having a number that you can call in your community that somebody will be familiar with a situation where someone it, mental health is someone's mental health is not where it needs to be. They're feeling um, like they might be in danger, but you don't want to escalate and cause the police because there's not a crime being committed um, in the Boston area where we live. It's um, called the best team and they will actually come and check on your your loved one and make sure they're okay. Yeah, we talk about um, uh, mobile crisis units or mobile psychiatric units. Um, the other thing that people should know <clears throat> is that there, <clears throat> excuse me, is a national number 988 that people can call. And it's in part the suicide prevention lifeline, but it's also a place that you could just get uh, emotional support and, um, and uh, find some uh, local resources. Absolutely. I want to follow up on one thing with you, um, and that is with regard to the privacy beyond there being a, a threat of harm to self or others. They can also give consent for you to talk to their family members. Absolutely. So let's not make it seem like it has to be one of these. So no. okay. yeah. just making sure that people know that. <laughs> All right. Um, how to help your loved one create a, a treatment team. Uh, uh, Christina, you have any thoughts on that? that you wanna add? Yes, um, I think it's really important, whoever you're going to be working with, whoever you identify as the client or the patient, for them to identify their person. Um, I think everybody needs to have a person, kind of like what we were just discussing as far as not pouring from an empty cup. The caregiver fatigue is real. Um, and so making sure that the person who is in charge of the care is also caring for themselves is the person that's struggling with mental illness is going to need that person. Um, so I think that's really important in making sure that they're feeling comfortable and safe with that person. I think a large part of it is going to be communication and understanding what everyone's perspective of what is happening is. Because I, in my experience, whatever whoever we identify as the client or the patient is not seeing the same thing that the caregiver may be seeing. So it's really important for both, you know, for everyone involved to understand what the pr perspective is as to what they're seeing and working from there. Um, and I think that's the best way to build the treatment team. And then working on the communication, like you may have a patient or a client that is not ready to talk about a lot of things that are going on, but what are you willing to share to help this person understand how to support and help you? You may not wanna tell them everything, you know, mom may know, oh, she broke up with someone, she doesn't want to say that, but maybe she just wants to say she feels sad and that's enough. And how can we go from there without the details not mattering so much? Because I think at the end of the day, we want to get to the core of whatever is going on and we want to treat that thing. Um, and I, I'll say, you'll hear me say this probably in every question you ask me, like, oh, education, people have to understand there are parents out there that don't believe in depression and mental illness. And there are children that do and know that something is wrong. And unfortunately, I think it's a double-edged sword because at some point with mental health, you need you do need consent. And you do need the parent to say, yes, my child can get counseling. Yes, my child can take meds. And so how do we meet in the middle where maybe we don't tell them everything, but we get them to understand that this is what the client or the patient really needs. I mean, I think that's really important. Okay, great. Uh, Letizia, you have anything? Uh... I will say Tia and Christina have, have said a lot of the things that were on my mind, but I, what I will add, you know, I talked about that initial assessment that I do with my clients. Um, and when it comes to building that team um, for them, I think that's the building blocks for it. That's why it's so important to have that information. Um, I really want to know what does your support system look like? And one of the primary reasons for that is because we know that that can be a protector for suicide. So let tell me what that looks like. Who is in your corner? Who can you call on? Or, or what types of things do you do when you get upset? And what works for you and what doesn't work for you? Um, and then when I find out who their people are, um, then I do want to ask them, hey, can we get them involved in this? And it goes back again to what Christina says, that's psychoeducation. 
maybe we don't have to give them all the details, but here's why I want them to know that you're here seeing me and that we're working on things because you're going to need some added support um, and being able to talk them through that and walk them through what that looks like. And even with my teenagers, sometimes there are things that are not quite suicide, but it's still kind of concerning, not to the point to where I would have to disclose it, disclose it to a family member, but it's probably a good idea they know. Um, and I think that, that that goes back to to my job of building rapport with that teenager, making sure that they know that they're in a safe space and that anything that we do is because, you know, it's out of care with, for them. And a lot of times, um, after talking to teenagers about my concerns, they're they're very, a lot of them have a lot of insight and very knowledgeable and talking to them about my concerns. They are usually agreeable with um, talking to parents about something that I, I think may be important for parents to know. And a lot of times that happens with me in the room, kind of guiding them, helping them through that process. Um, and then I'm able to by being a person in the room, I'm able to provide any support for parents at that time, any support for teenagers, and then give them support moving forward. Um, but again, having having that ground, um, that ground floor of the interview and knowing what their support systems are and figuring out how we can build on them. Another thing that I would mention, though, I know that Tia mentioned the safety plan a lot, um, and I do emergency psych a, a, a lot of the time. Um, and a safety plan is absolutely necessary um, if you, you have concerns like that. And one of the other things that I try to talk to families um, about are some of the warning symptoms. Um, again, communication is key. What I think depression is may not be what someone else thinks depression is, and it may look different from person to person to person. So talking to whoever my client is about what happens, what what lets you know that you're getting worse? What types of things do you start to notice? Maybe it's that you're not sleeping as good at night. Um, maybe it's that you notice that your appetite's kind of decreased or you're a little bit more irritable or you stop going to your baseball practices that you love. But what are those things? What are those signs? So that not only you become aware, but the people that you've told me now are part of your support team, the system can be on the lookout for these things. So if you miss it, maybe someone else around you will catch it and we know to intervene pretty early. I love what you said about the people around. And I think um, a lot of positive psychology looks towards um, what can, what do you, what do you have? Like, what are the resources that you have that are, are, are positive that you like? So a patient who's suffering from depression and anxiety um, will come into the office and I'll be like, why, why are you sad? And why are you depressed? Like, everything's terrible. Everything's terrible. Nothing is, no, nothing is good. But you brought your sister in here with you, like your sister. Yeah, I like my sister. Your sister was telling me that you knit. I like knitting. So kind of like, the support mm -hmm. people are so important, but also these protective factors around like, what do you, what do you like to do? What gives you hope and support? Um, interestingly enough for people um, like in my, in my world right now are very scientific and very logical. And we remind each other that religion can actually be protective. So if somebody um, comes in as a new patient visit, I often do like a religious or spiritual background kind of intake and say, you know, do you practice a, a faith that gives you hope? Or, um, mm -hmm. That's, that's actually really protective. And so um, people that are people that are leaning on that sometimes um, in my uh, culture and religion, a lot of people are kind of, um, um, they might not want to go to therapy because they think that it's not, um, they just need to go to church. Um, and so knowing that, you know, you can merge those two things, like those things are also like very, very powerful for you. So it's okay for you to go to therapy. It's also good for you to continue going to church and to seek help that way. So looking for those protective factors, people are great. Also things that people like to do is really powerful. Not mutually exclusive. <clears throat> um, uh, we have a program that the idea is that people uh, identifying who you can turn to um, and anyway. So turn to is the thing that people can remember uh, in terms of identifying you know, who around them uh, can be helpful in which ways. All right, um, Christina, 
those are the positives. Uh, what barriers or potential challenges should caregivers keep in mind when working with providers? We already know what Tia said about talking to people and privacy. <laughs> um, some of the barriers I think that I've come um, in contact with the most are probably, I think they were all mentioned here, culture, religion, and stigma. Those are the top three, especially um, being a practitioner of color. Most of my clients are, are uh, minorities. And I think now we're just coming, we're just coming to a bend where it's okay to start seeking mental health um, supports. But a lot of the time when you have um, older generations, like I think you just said it, they don't necessarily believe in mental health or you just need to go to church, you need to pray more. And there's that, that kind of conflict, internal conflict, like, well, if I do this, my family's gonna think I'm crazy or maybe I am crazy because this is not what we believe or you know, I just need to pray more. And I think um, those things can be tightly wound together and I'm just going to kind of repeat what you were saying. It's like, you can be spiritual and also seek help. Or how do you know that this particular person is not put in place to support this? Because God can do that too, you know? So it's kind of linking those things together where they start to come to a head themselves. Like maybe this is something that I can explore, or maybe this is something that I can explain to my family about, this is something I want to try. Um, and I think when it comes down to it, families want to have their loved ones alive more than anything. And if it is something that is gonna save their lives, then they need to be able to also communicate that to, to their people and their support system. And I think that's most important. So those barriers of the cultural, spiritual and stigma, particularly in minority communities are something I think that we're just now starting to work through. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, I do believe that one of the biggest challenges for a caregiver is, I mean, beyond the societal stuff, but in particular working with providers is navigating between being supportive and not being intrusive or, you know, keeping the good terms with your loved one uh, so that they engage you. Letizia, what's, what do you see from your perspective? I could talk about this topic forever. I've done tons of research. So I echo everything that Christina said. I will also say, if we're looking at it from the other perspective as well, for people who may be open to the idea of mental health treatment, um, but maybe they're a little concerned about health healthcare, the community in general, um, especially from different cultures. And I could go on and on and on about why different cultures may have a little bit more pause about healthcare. Um, it, it is a concern that a lot of times uh, the providers are not representative of the actual community. And so, um, um, and, and that, that, that's an issue. And then it can also create a problem when it comes to just communicating. I know for me and my culture, there are just certain terms that we use. I automatically know what that means and I'm able to move on from there. Whereas someone else who's not as familiar with the culture may take that to mean something different. And that could drastically differ how they would move forward with the treatment plan. I think about things like, um, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, certainly we use in my culture, I think we talk about our nerves a lot. Um, and I know that that just means anxiety. I mean, I'll ask more questions to clarify, but generally that's what that means. Or um, a lot of times with spiritual, with our spiritual beliefs, there are people who may um, believe that they're talking to their loved ones and things of that nature. That does not mean that they're psychotic. Um, and so that could be misconstrued by someone who is not familiar with the culture. So I certainly think that can be, those things can be additional barriers. And then we've talked about one ourselves here, the fact that mental health providers are just sparse um, in all the communities. So you have primary care providers with all the things that they have to do, and now you want them to also treat people's mental health needs also, um, and that's a problem. With COVID, we, we saw that telehealth helped that a little bit, um, and I'm hoping, my hope is that we continue to evolve and try to figure out ways to reach people who are in areas that they normally wouldn't be able to get mental health treatment. Absolutely. 
Um, hey, Tia, how about uh, barriers or potential challenges um, for caregivers? Absolutely piggybacking on um, what everyone has said so far. Um, it's really hard for me to get people into therapy and it could be someone who's totally down. They really want to go. Um, sometimes the patients that want to do some inpatient um, care, it's really hard for them to find places to go. And um, when they do, it's, it's very, um, I had a patient once who wanted to go um, to the hospital. They were worried about what they were going to do. We got them into a program within the hospital that was um, something that was set up during COVID, kind of like an emergency situation, which was great. But their uh, part of the program meant that you had to stay there um, in the hospital until they found you an inpatient location. And when my patient found out she was going to possibly have to stay in the ED or upstairs on the floor for 10 days before she went to where she wanted to go, that just kind of sent her over the edge. And so um, she was she was very upset. She was mad at me. <laughs> um, and it was it's hard trying to walk this line between trying to be protective and not be patriarchal and um, give the patient their autonomy. Um, another really big barrier is medications. Um, there's so much we don't know about the brain. And um, me saying, you know, the medication itself might not start to make you feel better and you might start to feel worse the first couple of weeks. So having, a, having to talk to somebody about that when they're really saying, I came to you when I was on the edge, like, I really need something to help me now, um, especially with all the information that people have. You know, the United States is one, I think the only country in the world or um, what we would call like a, I wanted the, the, I don't like using the word developed, so I'm just going to say rich. <laughs> the, one of the rich countries in the world that allow um, advertisement of medications on television. And so my patients are coming in and asking me, can I have this and can I have that? Um, there's some drugs that have totally fallen out of favor, as we've seen in the opioid crisis um, 10, 15 years ago. Um, they were telling us that these drugs were saving people's lives. You need to treat people's pain. And now we have people with severe addictions, um, not be, be struggling, losing their livelihoods because of their addictions to these medications that were prescribed by us. Um, so a patient coming in and asking me for a medication that worked well for their friend, um, that they really want, that I know is actually a short-term medication and not good for their long-term anxiety or depression and can cause more harm and has more addictive qualities. Um, it falls on me to walk this line of establishing trust and letting you make your own decisions and also say, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't give you that medication in good faith because I'm, I'm trying to practice good medicine and that's not safe. Um, so that safety and availability, as well as that cultural humility that we expect from providers to have um, to prevent um, causing harm to the patients. Sometimes um, providers, um, like Dr. Smith and Clemens mentioned, they don't know um, what's going on when someone is telling them something. And we see some examples that are silly, like the doctor that saw a patient tapping their braids like this over and over again and thought they were participating in some kind of um, um, tick or that they were having some kind of psychosis and didn't realize that her braids were itchy. <laughs> so she, that's how she's scratching her head. Something that seems very familiar to us or silly or the patient that um, uh, a resident had gone down into the ED to talk to about a case that they thought might be um, uh, a child abuse case as a girl had uh, burns on her neck and realized that their mother had stuck her braids in hot boiling water and thought that this was some kind of um, abuse ritual when all of us stick the ends in hot water to get curls at the end. And so they didn't realize that this was actually an accident because they lacked the cultural humility to be able to understand um, something that was outside their purview. Yeah, there's a lot uh, that people have to know that they don't know, for sure. Um, well. I wish we could go on and on and on and on, um, but it's getting to be time for us to transition to the Zoom room. So if you watching this would like to join us and you're not on Zoom, please head over to familywear.org slash trainings, um, complete the registration and you'll be able to jump right in. Uh, you're invited to put questions in the chat um, and shortly you'll have the opportunity to unmute. You guys have been amazing so far, but don't leave. Um, uh, if you're, let me just share the screen thing. Yeah. 
Um, we did that already. Um, if you're leaving now, please, please, please take our survey. Uh, we'll send you a copy of our coping with stress brochure. It's um, bit.ly slash FFDA Jan 2623 survey. Go figure that one out. Um, but we'd love to hear from you. It's really important to us. Um, we don't know how we're doing unless you tell us. We don't know what else you want to learn unless you tell us. So please, please, uh, we take your feedback very seriously and we very much appreciate it. Um, uh, as I had mentioned before, this is part one of a two-part series. If in fact you do um, the survey for this and come to the next show and do the survey for that one, we're gonna send you our awesome 60 page caregiver's handbook. So um, I wanna see you back here, uh, February 16, maybe 16. Um, uh, so beyond thanking our panelists, uh, thank you all for spending this time with us. Uh, we are grateful to our funders for their support, uh, including Takeda Lundbeck Alliance, Sage Therapeutics, Gene Sight, Alchemies, Pair Therapeutics, Janssen Neuroscience, and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, if this session is uh, helpful to you, please forward the link, share on Facebook, whatever, uh, with your friends, family, and colleagues. They'll be able to watch the recording um, on Facebook right away and YouTube probably starting tomorrow. So thank you all for joining us. Stay tight. If you're in the Zoom room, don't leave. We'll be right with you.